Hello, my name is Michelle Moran. I am a precision cancer medicine educator and advocate, and I am here today with the cancer guy, Alexander Rowland, a precision cancer medicine researcher uh, and um, most knowledgeable person that pretty much anybody will ever meet when it comes to cancer. Uh, really, I hear this all the time. Uh, so not just my perspective. Um, but Alex is here today to share uh, about a uh, brand new development for, uh, as you can see on your screen, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. So we're just going to share a little presentation with you so you can get some current information about uh, a novel new therapy. Alex. Yeah, this is an exciting new study. Um, it involves immune therapy for prostate cancer, um, and immune therapy typically hasn't been used in prostate cancer. We consider the prostate an immune dead area, um, and that's kind of important because you don't want your immune cells going in there and attacking um, the prostate or any of the uh, products of the prostate because um, then you wouldn't be able to reproduce. So typically the ovaries and the reproductive organs are what we call immune privileged. However, we're starting to see there's some variation on that. Um, but in this particular study, it uses an immune system or immune therapy enhancer that's quite exciting. So I'm going to talk about that. Okay. So uh, in this trial, it's a, it's a recent contact O2 trial. It was patients with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. They had uh, extra pelvic nodes. In other words, they had lymph node metastasis. Um, outside of the pelvic region. And they also had visceral metastasis. So that means to different organs. So, you know, true stage four. And these patients were treated with a combination of cabozantinib plus atezolizumab. And atezolizumab is a immune therapy, a PD-1 inhibitor. Okay. Um, and they compared that with the standard care, which at that time was hormone treatment. So a little bit about cabozantinib. Um, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. That means it's a targeted therapy, but it has a bunch of different targets. Um, and that could be a good thing and a bad thing. Um, if you have a tyrosine kinase inhibitor with, um, that targets too many different signaling cascades, then you get a lot of side effects and mm -hmm. it's hard to get a therapeutic dose. But I think cabozantinib is a nice balance of that. Uh, it works specifically um, on certain areas that uh, tumor cells use to suppress um, PD-1 inhibitors and T cells in general. Mm -hmm. So one of those is tumor associated macrophages. So it interferes with them. It also inhibits uh, the tumor specific recruitment of blood vessels, which is referred to as angiogenesis. Um, and then there's also a gene that's overactivated uh, called MET. Um, and that can uh, result in various pathways of resistance to uh, immune therapy and T cells, and then also uh, axial signaling. So here's a little uh, mechanism. I took this from um, one of Neil, Neil Love's videos, okay. and it's about how cabozantinib mechanism works. Um, and so as you can see, uh, you have the different uh, immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. Um, you have the macrophages, uh, you have the um, you know regulatory T cells, you have neutrophils, um, and so, you have the cytotoxic T cells. Um, so basically, this cabozantinib works on all these different four pathways. Mm. So uh, for for tumor associated macrophages, uh, it, it increases the number of circulating and tumor infiltrating cytotoxic T cells, which is good. You want that? These are the T cells that kill the tumor. For VEGF uh, receptor inhibition, it uh, decreases the number and function of regulatory T cells, and those are cells that can prevent the tumor infiltrating T cells from working properly. It also blocks the MET inhibition, um, and uh, that's uh, expression of PDL1. Um, also blocks mobilization of immunosuppressive neutrophils, which is part of the MET signaling. And then um, also, uh, I won't get into this, but increases tumor MHC class 1 expression, and that is uh, basically a different arm of the immune system. So we did discuss. Uh, how cabozantinib works previously, quite some time ago, we did a YouTube uh, video on it. Um, and that, in this particular video, uh, we gave quite a few different examples of how cabozantinib could be added to, um, you know, standard PD-1 inhibitors to improve how they work. Yeah. And it was quite exciting. There was a lot of different uh, types of cancers that normally wouldn't respond to immune therapy or PD-1 inhibitors that were getting a great response from this. So uh, in this particular trial, and, you know, Please note that these are, you know, very sick people. Uh, they really don't have any other, um, you know, treatment options. And so the good thing that I like about this trial is it broke it down based on the patient's previous treatments. 
So um, in general, there's a 14 at, at 14.3 months, there is a significant improvement in the progression free survival. And that's the median. So that is uh, how long the patients are on the drug uh, before 50% of them have a recurrence. Um, that's uh, all all uh, progression free survival is a median. Same with overall survival. Median meaning um, when 50% of the patients in the trial have uh, recurrence. So there, at that point in time, there was a 35% reduction in the risk of death or progression of disease compared to those who treated with uh, hormonal therapy. And so the the average was 6.3 months versus 4.2 months. Mm. Uh, however, in patients with liver metastasis, um, the radiographic progression-free survival, in other words, based on a scan, in those treated with the combination therapy was six months uh, compared to only 2.1 months of patients treated with hormonal therapy. So that's an extra four months, um, you know, before their tumors start getting larger. Uh, and then in patients who receive prior dose of taxal treatment, which really is the last line of standard care, um, the radiographic progression-free survival was 8.8 .8 months. So almost double that compared to hormone therapy. So, you know, obviously the, the question begs is what if this is done at a much earlier stage? I was just going to ask you that. You know, I, I would I would think that it's going to be much more effective, you know, particularly in the neoadjuvant setting. Mm -hmm. um, and at a follow-up six months, the overall response rate was also higher in patients who received cabozantinib plus atezolizumab compared with those who received um, hormonal therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was 13.6% uh, versus 4.2% respectively. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, um, and at, at six months, overall response rate, as I said, 13.6 versus 4.2. Uh, the median progression free survival is 6.3 versus 4.2 for hormone therapy. This is overall uh, with liver metastasis, 6.0 versus 2.1. Mm -hmm. And then those treated with dose attacks, it was 8.8 .8 versus 4.1. This yeah. is just basically a summary slide over what I just went over. Sure. The liver metastasis is an interesting one because uh, as a rule, folks who have liver metastasis have a really hard time metabolizing treatment and they don't do so well on treatments. Yeah. Um, so they're actually some of the better responders to this mm -hmm. approach, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. Yeah, definitely. Um, it really did make a big difference for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I was just thinking the same thing. You know, it, it, the way these things work, um, when you're thinking about cancer research and, and studies on human beings, of course, we have to be careful. We have to be mindful of the patient's well-being. And uh, doctors will often use the term an abundance of caution. And they might use that term to explain why they're not going to prescribe you anything because they don't believe they have a particular treatment that's really going to add much benefit. And, you know, that's where they might suggest palliative chemo or they might even suggest nothing at this point. Um, because they want this abundance of caution, which really is the kind of do no harm. They they understand that perhaps at, at a later stage or with perhaps, again, liver metastasis or other things, there are likely to be some side effects and, it, and it's not going to give you that much more time in their mind. All that is to say, when we're doing these trials or these types of combinations are being trialed for the first time, kind of the only way um, researchers can get approval to do these trials is on quite late stage patients. So when we start to see, Alex, please correct me if I'm totally off base here, but when we start to see some uh, good results or improvement in very late stage patients, that is when these treatments can start to kind of move forward um, and, and ultimately become uh, tested as first line. So we can see how much more effective they can be, how many people perhaps that get this very early on never end up in these later stages. Um, that's kind of my understanding of how these, these yeah. new treatments roll out as we started kind of with the, the folks who are the farthest along with no other options. And then kind of as proof comes in, work back to the beginning. But that's one of the things I appreciate about your education, Alex, is because you're you tell us about the mechanisms of these things and kind of how they're working and why they're working. And that it, that's a really important element for patients and advocates to understand um, how this could be more effective if we can get it earlier. Uh, and often there is a way. Yeah, well, it's just a general theme. Um, whenever you use a treatment, you know, and I, I, I don't think I've seen too many cases where it's been the opposite. Um, you know, if it works in late stage, advanced cancers that are highly heterogeneous, in other words, they have a lot of variation in their molecular features, mm -hmm. uh, then it's definitely going to work much better in a, uh, a case that has much less heterogeneity 
and yeah. is more specific. And, you know, we know as a theme that um, immune therapy typically works best in the neoadjuvant setting. In other words, when you have a primary tumor that's been unaffected by treatment, um, because then it allows the immune system to get a snapshot of all of the antigens of the primary tumor. And then when it does metastasize, it has this large repertoire of, of uh, immune responses, you know, antibodies and so on that it can use to recognize tumors in different places. Yeah. And I mean, you've been doing this for 14 plus years now. Um, and we've just seen time and time again that, you know, when something like this comes out and, and it's mm -hmm. perceived as a late stage thing, you know, if we can get it uh, started earlier on for people, it does become, uh, if not the standard of care, it's a lot easier to get doctors to prescribe it as a first or second line as opposed to a last resort. And it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just a, just a little bit about the side effects. Uh, cabozantinib does have some side effects because it is a, a multi-target tyr tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Okay. Um, and uh, in this particular study, the, the grade three and four side effects uh, where 48% of those with cabozantin plus atezolizumab and 23% treated with hormone therapy. So it is definitely an increase in side effects, but also an increase in um, obviously survival and progression-free survival. Yeah. And the other thing, and we say this often, is there are so many new treatments coming out every month with agnostic approvals, meaning it doesn't matter what kind of cancer you've been identified to have. What matters are the molecular features of your cancer. Uh, and of course, Alex and his team are all about figuring that out for you with genetic testing. But why I'm mentioning that is because, well, you know, an extra four, six or eight months might not sound too exciting. Um, of course, it's something. And the more time you can have, the more possibility there is that one of those drugs that's perfect for your molecular features will be approved in that window and you can have even more time um, and that's really what we're shooting for. If we can't create complete remission, um, at least getting you into a good quality of life and kind of serial treatments to help to help knock out the the latest driver of your cancer or the thing that is most prevalent and need, needing attention. Um, and that's definitely a thing that's possible now. Uh, so if you want to know more about how Alex can help you, uh, the link here, ctome.com forward slash consultation, or by all means, just email us through the website or post something on the YouTube channel. Do hit the subscribe button. Make sure that you uh, get uh, all of the videos. We're putting new videos up every week right now. Uh, and there's lots of information about our free online course and all sorts of things like that that you'll see in our YouTube channel uh, video descriptions as well. So we look forward to hearing from you. Let us know how we can help you.